Spirometry, Procedure and Results How do you know what kind of problem your patients have that causes them to come in due to respiratory problems? Pulmonary function can be evaluated closely using two methods, spirometry and body plethysmography. These tests can be used to differentiate between restrictive and obstructive lung diseases. Let's briefly introduce these conditions. Restrictive lung diseases are characterized by the impaired ability of the lungs to expand fully. An example is pulmonary fibrosis. In contrast, obstructive lung diseases are characterized by narrowing of the bronchi, leading to difficulties exhaling air. Common diseases that cause obstruction are bronchial asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, in short, COPD. So, pulmonary function testing provides important results to identify ventilatory defects. In this Chalk Talk series on pulmonary function, we'll first start by explaining what spirometry is, followed by body plethysmography. Using this as a basis, we'll explain how to interpret pulmonary function test results to differentiate between restrictive and obstructive pulmonary diseases. Let's start by looking at the spirometry procedure. The term spirometry stems from the Latin word spirare, meaning to breathe. So spirometry basically means the measuring of breath. It quantifies the volume and speed of air that is inhaled and exhaled. The patient is asked to sit upright or stand in front of the spirometry machine and to breathe through a mouthpiece connected to the machine. Meanwhile, the nostrils are closed using a nose clip, ensuring that all breathing is done through the mouthpiece measuring the flow of air. Two parameters are of particular relevance. Tidal volume, which is the volume of air that is inhaled and exhaled in a single breath, and airflow. One means of measurement is to detect the rotation speed of a turbine, which can be used to deduce the volume breathed. The second means is by using a resistor in the mouthpiece to observe pressure changes. By measuring pressure before and after resistance, the difference between these values can be used to determine the airflow. Besides these methods, airflow can be recorded through other means, such as measurement by ultrasound. But we don't want to delve too deep into the physical details, though one thing we'd like to note is that tidal volume and airflow are closely related to one another, and airflow can be calculated from the tidal volume. It's measured in liters per second, while the volume of air expired or inspired is measured in liters. Still, through this depiction, we'd like to give a memory aid. The parameters determined using spirometry can be categorized into two groups. They're either volumes, like the vital capacity, or flow rates, such as the peak expiratory flow. We'll first take a look at volume and then build up on this basis by exploring airflow in more detail. So let's get started. During spirometry, the patient is asked to perform various breathing maneuvers, from which a graphical output of the respired volume against time is presented as a curve. This curve is termed a volume time curve. Volume is shown along the y-axis and time along the x-axis. At the beginning, the patient is asked to take normal breaths. During inspiration, lung volume increases, which is represented by a rising curve. When exhaling, the curve falls accordingly. We can now see the tidal volume, in short, TV. Next, the patient is requested to maximally exhale and then maximally inhale. For this, the reserve volumes of the lungs are used. The volumes are referred to as expiratory reserve volume, in short, ERV, and inspiratory reserve volume, in short, IRV. The volume of air that remains in the lungs after maximal exhalation is termed residual volume. If certain volumes are combined together, these are termed capacity. An important example is the vital capacity, in short, VC, which is the sum of the tidal volume, expiratory reserve volume, and inspiratory reserve volume. The normal vital capacity lies between 4.5 and 5 liters and varies between individuals. Here, in the described maneuver, the vital capacity is measured during inhalation. The determined volume is accordingly termed inspiratory vital capacity, in short, IVC. Now, let's look at the procedure. 
the patient is instructed to exhale completely, followed by deep inspiration. Next, a maximum volume of air is forcibly exhaled as rapidly as possible. This last part is termed forced expiration, that is, exhalation on exertion. Two values are measured during this process. First, the maximum forced expiratory volume of air expired within one second after maximal inspiration is termed FEV1. Second, the maximum volume of air forcibly expired after maximal inspiration is measured. This is termed forced vital capacity, in short, FVC. The FEV1 value depends on the forced vital capacity. Let's take a more simplified look at this. Imagine the FEV1 as the measure of an attempt to blow up a balloon as much as possible within one second. An individual with large lungs is capable of blowing a considerable amount of air into the balloon, whereas someone with smaller lungs can only blow a small amount of air. Similarly, a patient with obstructive pulmonary disease can also blow only a small amount of air into the balloon, even though the size of the lung would allow for larger amounts. This is a result of airway narrowing. To exclude any effects as a result of the varying lung sizes in practice, it's quite useful to relate the FEV1 with the vital capacity. The ratio of the forced expiratory volume in one second to the forced vital capacity is termed FEV1 to FVC ratio, or the tiffano pinelli index. It's expressed as a percentage and therefore also termed relative FEV1. Healthy individuals exhale more than 70% of their vital capacity during the first second. A reduced FEV1 to FVC ratio indicates airway obstruction. Before we continue, let's briefly summarize the most important aspects of spirometry. During spirometry, the patient is instructed to breathe out completely, followed by deep inspiration and forceful expiration of the maximum volume of air as quickly as possible. This enables the inspiratory vital capacity, the FEV1, and the forced vital capacity to be measured and the ratio between both to be determined. Until now, we've presented these parameters in a volume time curve to establish the basics. However, in clinical practice, representation in a flow volume loop is more commonly used, as changes in lung pathology are directly reflected in the shape of this curve. The flow volume loop plots volume against airflow rate. On the left, inspiration, and on the right, expiration. Let's start with a point on the curve in which the patient has exhaled normally. When the patient takes a breath, the curve rises rapidly because of the increase in volume. At the same time, the curve moves to the left side of the y-axis as we plot inspiration on the left side of the diagram. When the patient subsequently exhales, the curve moves to the right side. Because the inhaled and exhaled volumes are the same, a loop is formed, returning to the starting point. This corresponds to basal respiration, and the volume of air breathed is the tidal volume, which we came across in the initial curve. Now let's look at the rest of the breathing maneuver. The patient is requested to exhale as much as they can, followed by taking a deep breath and then forcibly expiring as fast as possible. After this maximal expiration, only the residual volume remains in the lungs. The patient is requested to maximally inspire increasing the lung volume until the vital capacity is reached. The curve now takes the form of a bulge. At the beginning of inspiration, airflow increases and then later decreases as the lungs fill up with air again. Next, the patient exhales forcibly. Through the accelerated expiration, a large flow of air can be achieved quickly, which slows again with increasing expiration. Why don't you give it a try? Breathe in and out all the air as quickly as possible. You'll feel that you can exhale a lot of air at the beginning, meaning there's a high airflow, which then decreases gradually. At the end of expiration, your lungs are maximally emptied. So you can see, the flow volume loop provides information similar to the volume time curve. Although the flow volume loop is more abstract and initially not that easy to follow, the advantage of this curve is that ventilatory disorders can be identified through changes in the shape of the curve. Usually, the flow volume loop is rotated by 90 degrees, as changes in the curve can be better identified from this perspective. So, 
Let's rotate the diagram. Now, here the airflow rate is plotted on the x-axis and volume on the y-axis. The height of the curve indicates the peak flow. The large upward deflection is the maximum airflow rate, the peak expiratory flow, in short, PEF, that's reached shortly after starting expiration. In addition to the peak expiratory flow, there's also the mean expiratory flow. With these parameters, the curve can be specified at certain time points in which a particular percentage of the vital capacity has been exhaled. So the parameters are measured at 25%, 50%, and 75% of the forced vital capacity. These values are usually abbreviated as FEF for forced expiratory flow, followed by the percentage, which are FEF 25%, FEF 50%, and FEF 75%. So why are these parameters so interesting? If the airflow is decreased, then the individual parameters indicate which specific region in the respiratory tract is affected by obstruction. At the time when the peak expiratory flow is observed, exhaled air predominantly comes from the trachea and upper bronchi. Therefore, the peak expiratory flow is primarily a measure of the upper respiratory tract. The FEF 25% is observed when 25% of the vital capacity is exhaled, mainly from the middle part of the respiratory tract. The FEF 50% and FEF 75% refer to the airflow rates at 50% or 75% of the exhaled vital capacity. The airflow at these time points reflects the width of the smaller bronchi. For example, a decrease in only the FEF 50% and FEF 75% indicates peripheral airway obstruction. Okay, so that wraps it up on spirometry and its important parameters. In a clinical setting, you'll come across a spirometry report like this at some stage. You'll see the flow volume loop and eventually the volume time curve. Next to this, you'll find the measured parameters. The most important parameters are the vital capacity, forced expiratory volume in one second, and the ratio of the forced expiratory volume in one second to the forced vital capacity. We've also introduced you to airflow parameters, including peak expiratory flow, as well as the forced expiratory flow at 75, 50, and 25%. Alongside these measured values, the report will show two other columns. One states the corresponding reference values, and the other provides the percentage share of the measurements in the reference values. We're not yet going to delve into interpreting these values in this episode, but we'll do so at a later stage. Finally, here's an important point that requires mentioning. Spirometry has a crucial limitation. It can only measure volumes that can be mobilized. In other words, the volume that can be inhaled or exhaled. But we can see in this diagram that even after full expiration, a residual volume of air remains in the lungs. This residual volume can't be measured using spirometry, though it would be interesting as it can provide us with important information on lung function. Added to the vital capacity, we obtain the total lung capacity. This is the total amount of air contained in the lungs after maximal inspiration. To determine the immobilizable volumes as well as the total lung capacity, body plethysmography is required, which we'll look at in the next episode in this Chalk Talk series. Before we do that, let's move on to the quiz.